Everlord. Hi, Philip. You're muted. Oh, and you're not no. Philip. <laughs> no. I think it's still, the, it's still the remnants of when Philip had put everybody as his name, so I have to change it all, right. every time now. <laughs> ah. <laughs> So it's just Lisette and Angelique that we're waiting for. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Angelique and Lisette. Yep, that's it. Hello, new members. Hi, Erica. Hi. Hi. Hey. How are you doing? Hey. So to be excited here. to be here. No, very happy to uh, see the new faces. <laughs> very exciting. Um, do we wanna we wanna get started and then hopefully they'll join in? I think that makes sense. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking for the agenda. Um, do you want me to kick things off? Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Um, all right. So this is the it is. 632 and I'm calling the meeting of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee to order um, on November 13th at 633. 632. Every clock says something different. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. 632. Um, pursuant to the Acts of Chapter Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so quickly to go over the agenda. Sorry. First, we're going to introduce ourselves make sure we can everybody can hear each other and welcome our new members we have two new members with us right now tonight hopefully a third one will be joining us at some point during the evening um so we deborah and i had talked and thought we could at least all introduce ourselves with our name and what interested us in joining this committee i don't know i'm i'm tongue-tied tonight so maybe somebody uh deborah do you yeah. want to start and i can breathe for a second yeah for sure <laughs> so you know also like how you want us to you know if, if you prefer to however you want your name to be and things like that how you want us to address you please also share that um and also a little bit about yourself if you want to share a little bit about yourself and why um you are interested in joining um cssjc and i'll i'll start with myself um, so, you know, Deborah Ferreira, um, but in my language, uh, my name is actually Deborah Ferreira, um, and I'm from West Africa, from Cape Verde Islands, and that's where I was born. I'm an immigrant to this country. Um, so I work at the university, um, UMass Amherst, I've been there for over 20 years, um, and have dedicated my life to civil rights. I directed their um, Equal Opportunity and Diversity Office for many years, um, over 17 years, and then uh, transitioned to the Office of General Counsel. I'm one of the attorneys that advises the entire um, UMass system. Um, and, you know, I do a variety of different, besides CSSJC, I also uh, volunteer at other uh, youth um, organizations, um, and I do a lot of work also within the Cape Verdean community, not only here in Amherst, but in New Bedford. Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. Um, so civil rights is very dear to me and why I do it is because I want everyone to be who they are. I don't want people to be um, harassed or discriminated because of who they are, their identity, um, however they want to present themselves to the world, right? Um, and for me, why I got involved in CSSJC is because after the George, George Floyd murder, I was nominated to join this uh, community safety and working group um, and I was one of the original members of that group, which then obviously CSSJC was, was, was birthed from as a standing committee. And then uh, 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 the variety of recommendations that we monitor and put into place 
are also a, a huge part of what it is that we do at CSSJC. So for me, the why I joined Community Safety Working Group is because I said um, I have two children. One is 20, the other one's 15, Black males in this country. And I was really afraid for them because um, our uh, Black and Brown bodies are not safe um, in this country um, in, and I, I dare say in the world. And so for me, I wanted to do uh, what I could to make sure that um, anyone who's BIPOC and anyone who um, also is, gets othered in this world um, has a, 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 you know, a place and that I wanted to do that work. And so when I got involved too, I did not want to waste my time. So for me, it's very dear um, why I, I show up every, every month um, and volunteer this time because I don't have the time to, 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 to waste, right? Um, and so, you know, that's what I've been doing since 2020, um, you know, meeting basically when it was CSWG on a, on a weekly basis and now monthly and then as needed. But I'll pass the baton to Allegra. Um, thank you, Deborah. And again, thank you for all the work that you continue to do for our community. Um, so my name is Allegra Clark. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a social worker during the day, um, but I have primarily worked in the forensic system. So I've worked in prisons, I've worked in DCF, I've worked in DYS, so Children and Families Division of Youth Services, and um, I work in the courts currently mostly doing substance use and mental health evaluations. Um, but I sit in open court all the time and I see the racial disparities and who's being charged with what, how the sentences are handed down. Um, you know, the course of a case can vary greatly depending on what court I'm sitting in and, you know, who's, who the defendant is, what they look like, um, what communities they're coming from and what resources they have available to them. So I, after, I, can you hear me? Sometimes my computer does a weird thing. Okay. Um, similarly to Deborah, after George Floyd's murder, I I wanted to get more involved in the community and what could be done differently, especially around policing. Um, I was involved more with some of the kind of organic organizing that went on with um, calls to defund the police. And that was something that I was interested in shifting resources from policing into programs like CRESS and more community-based services, um, especially in a town like Amherst, where the majority of calls are nonviolent and up to, I believe, 30% of the calls at the time that we were looking at this um, were more mental health related. So trying to get the right resources to the scenario um, to de-escalate things and, and to try and really increase and improve safety in the community. So that is what brought me to the work of the CSSJC. Um, so I've been the co-chair since our beginning in 2022. Um, and I'm excited that we will have new members on board and I will pass it to Dr. Pat Romney, and I do want to just mention that Lisette and Everald are with us. They just don't have video on at this time. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Allegra. So, um, Pat Romney, I'm fine with everybody calling me Pat. Um, I have lived in Amherst for 42 years, I think it is now. Yeah, 42 years. Mm -hmm. um, I came from... Um, I was, I'm from the Bronx, New York, and lived in Connecticut before coming here. I came to take a job at, at Mount Holyoke as the therapist of what they called then, back in the day, a third world therapist. I was the first therapist of color at the Mount Holyoke College Health Service uh, and have worked in many roles here. I'm a retired professor. I taught both at um, Hampshire College and at Mount Holyoke College. Um, for 20 years and left to start my own consulting business. I've been involved in social justice um, all my life, um, starting in the 1970s when I belonged to a group called the, um, the Third World Women's Alliance. I've, I've written a book about it 
while we were there, the Third World Women's Alliance in the second wave, documenting the presence of women of color in the first wave of feminism. My commitment to social justice is very intersectional, race, class, gender, abilities, um, and uh, taught the psychology of oppression at Hampshire College for many years. I've raised three children in Amherst and will now and now have a six-year-old grandson who's growing up in Amherst. So I'm very uh, committed to making sure that he and all, all of our young people, as well as ourselves, live in a socially just environment. I'm a liberatory thinker. I believe in moving us forward um, to thinking about liberation and being open to change. Uh, I spent many years as a consultant, a social justice consultant and trainer, uh, along with my husband and uh, colleague, Michael Funk. Uh, we conducted an anti-racism training of the Amherst Police Department uh, during COVID. So that's three, four years now ago now. Um, and uh, I'm still working uh, principally as uh, a leadership coach to higher educational professionals. And I do um, a fair amount of work on dialogue and conducted last year about uh, three dialogues in Amherst um, along with our former um, state Senator Stan Rosenberg. I think that's everything and I'm glad to be here. I wanted to just be a part of it to continue my work on social justice. And I will pass it to Erica. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very hard to follow. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that <laughs> drew me to this group is the inspiration that each one of you brings uh, in terms of your commitment to ensuring that Amherst is an inclusive, equitable, and fair community, especially in terms of raising um, our youth. And um, I don't want to say next generation because they are the present generation. Um, and my background, um, I've been in Amherst since 1994. Um, I predominantly came um, to grad school here and um, just absolutely love the community. Um, I have a history of family members um, who actually graduated from UMass. Um, so I remember coming here, I think when I was five, six years old um, to actually have a picnic and a barbecue at Mill River. It took me many years to figure out that's where it was. Um, and I come from a very blended family. Um, I, my father's actually Cape Verdean. I was born in Portugal. My mother's German, um, but it was uh, my younger sister's African-American community that actually got us here to the United States. Um, and I lived through some, um, some very um, difficult times uh, that really just in terms of lived experience, um, continuously looking at, uh, I think as Deborah said, um, you know, people who are marginalized, uh, traumatized, um, but resilient. The fact that we constantly worked to move forward, uh, demonstrate our, demonstrates our resiliency, as well as the fact that we're still here. Um, and so that has been sort of my um, background in, in ensuring that all that I do, social justice is part of it. Um, my profession is public health, though I'm now retired. Uh, I worked in public health, actually in higher education as well. So when I came to grad school, I actually worked in residence life. Um, and in residence life, you can see the class, race, um, gendered, um, all kinds of isms um, that exist institutionally and bears upon students uh, in terms of either access, lack of access, uh, or even their ability to succeed. And then working for the Department of Public Health. In the Department of Public Health, I actually worked for the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, uh, again, bringing um, my lens around social justice and equity, um, especially to treatment programs uh, that really lacked that uh, and then from there, I actually worked with the uh, Office of Local Regional Health that worked with 351 local boards of health, as well as the two federally recognized tribes, which doesn't include the seven other tribes, many other tribes that are not federally recognized, um, but are state recognized. And so I integrate my commitment to all the work that I've done. Um, I've been on the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, which is going to end next June, and I really wanted to be continuously serving my community and being part of my community. So um, this was an opportunity to put myself forward um, among very esteemed colleagues here um, to really work towards creating an inclusive, equitable community. So uh, thank you for 
including me in this. And I hope I can rise, um, you know, to to the level of inspiration that all of you uh, present here. So thank you for your service and thank you for having me come. Oh, and I'm going to pass it to Lisette. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, wow, that was a lot. Um, and that's amazing. Mine's going to be a little bit shorter. Um, so my name is Lisette Barreles. Um, I am a resident of Amherst um, for about 24 years since I was six years old. Um, I went through the Amherst school system with the exception of high school. Um, I only work for the Massachusetts Trial Court. And what led me to come into this committee was, um, you know, the fact that I grew up with Spanish um, speaking parents in a very uh, close minded Hispanic culture. And also, we didn't have knowledge of resources or groups that were out there. And I think till this day, there are still individuals in our community that don't have that type of um, knowledge or, you know, these programs haven't been extended out to them. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to join this committee. Uh, my father also had some sort of an altercation with the Amherst Police Department, um, the other party being a uh, European descent. And, you know, he was treated very differently than that individual. Um, and that is mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I, you know, have been pushed to come into this committee. And I'm learning. Um, I've been a member since October, I believe, of last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I mean, August of last year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but every meeting, it's something new. And I'm not as outspoken, but my wheels are spinning. But you know, I'm very glad to have you two um, ladies join this committee, and it sounds like you are going to be very great. All right, and last but not least, Evro. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Evro Henry. Um, my camera is off because I have my little one tonight, and you'll hear and see if I don't turn it off. Um, <laughs> So I am a local attorney in Amherst. Um, I actually wear different hats. I do healthcare law for Mass General Brigham. So I do a lot of um, mm. Mass Health, um, a lot of community care. Um, I focus a lot with um, low income population when I do healthcare. Um, I actually met Allegra prior to this committee because um, I also do criminal law, and so I met Allegra in court when she evaluated a few of my clients, so I know her through that. Um, and I also do immigration law. Um, one of the things I learned when I was, I so part of my criminal practice is I take clients who cannot afford attorneys. Um, one of the things I learned is that there's a bit of an overlap sometimes when you're an immigrant and you're charged with something and you don't have the right papers or if you have a visa, if you're a student. And so it becomes a little bit tricky navigating the criminal justice system and then having to worry about immigration as well. I have an immigrant family, so I have done and gone through the immigration process with them. So I know um, how to navigate that very well. And so those are my three areas that I focus on and um, service has always been part of my life. I have spent um, ever since high school, I believe there was never a time that I wasn't volunteering for something. Um, my parents always taught me that, well, most of my grandmother that, you know, you got to give back whenever you can. Um, mm -hmm. So I have never not volunteered for something. Um, I spent Many summers actually um, in Jamaica teaching elementary education, um, math, English, writing. So um, I've done work um, there as well for um, local elections and general elections. Um, elections matter to me as well because choosing who represents you is um, very important. So I do like to be engaged. And I actually learned about CSSJC from an actual judge. Um, so <laughs> I was um, before a judge that actually got funding for Cress. Part um, she was part of the group that got we got funding for Cress, and she essentially approached me and said, um, "I think you need to do something for the town of Amherst, and I think this is what you should do." 
And um, every time I was before her, she kept asking me, have you done this yet? Have you done this yet? Have you done this yet? So when a judge tells you, you got to go do something, you got to go do something. So um, I learned that CSSJC was looking for people and I met with the town manager and I was appointed. Um, I also sit on the Zoning Board of Appeals as well. Um, so I actually do volunteer for CSSJC and ZBA for the town of Amherst. I have lived in Amherst now since about 2017. I do have to tell you, um, I didn't choose to come to Amherst, <laughs> but you follow your spouse where <laughs> who's in academia. And so I'm actually a city person and lived in Boston for the longest time. And then the first time I came to Amherst is when we're actually looking at houses. So that was, um, it was very different for me um, being in such a big city to a small town, but we love it very much. Um, we met great people here, great friends here, built a community here. So the fact that this is home for us, um, I want to make sure that um, it is equitable for everyone that lives here. And I think being part of this community helps with that. And that is why I'm here. So again, Erica and Pat, welcome. Happy to have you. Um, Camille and Pamela, would you also like to introduce yourselves? You don't have to, but. <laughs> I, I think I can just do my introduction when I do the updates. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Camille, does that work for you as well? Um, so moving along, um, oh my gosh, it just disappeared. Okay. We will have, I'm going to review the agenda and then we can do announcements and approval of minutes and, um, well, actually, you know what, before before we do that real quick, since we have the, the new members here, just so you all know, um, you know, we want to make sure that you all have as much information as possible. Hopefully you all have gone to the CSSJC, um, you know, page to look at the, the CSSJC work, as well as the CSWG reports, because those are really a foundation and foundational information for you to know, because a lot of what we're going to be referring to and talking about uh, for much of our meetings and in between meetings will be focused on the CSWG recommendations and then obviously building from that and of course listening from the community because the community also shares issues that are occurring right that we, we need to bring up and we'll hear some of those during public comment or they they come to us right so me the community always comes to me different members come to me and say Deborah can you please touch upon this da -da. and I'm sure you all are also going to start getting some of that those touch points and so um, then we'll discuss it. But also we wanted you all to have an, uh, an idea about the open meeting laws and have more of an understanding around that. And also the budget process, which is very important, right? A lot of these things that we talk about has to have the funding connected to it. And I remember when I first started working um, with the town in that working group, this community safety working group, we weren't told a lot of the information, like when budget deadlines happen and when monies need to be in, when they need to be allocated. And so that's critical towards the work that we do, right? You got to follow the money a lot of the times. And so I actually did try to get um, someone from town to come and talk to you all today about it, but there wasn't anyone. So I guess Athena, I'm forgetting Athena's last name, and she's the one that, you know, is kind of the the person that helps run the town council meetings and things like that. I guess she's also connected to budget. So we've invited her to come to our next meeting to, to, to discuss open meeting laws as well as the budget process, okay? Um, so that we can go through that. Also, in terms of agendas, because I was talking to Camille, um, and who's our staff liaison. So Camille is our staff liaison for CSSJC about how we're going to deal with agendas on a monthly basis. Um, and we'll send this out by email as reminders, Allegra and I, but basically by Monday prior to our meeting, not the, not the, 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 the Monday week prior, we're going to send out a call for agenda items. Those that need to be in by Wednesday, the week before our meeting, right? So that we can send a finalized agenda to um, Camille's um, um, staff person, um, Angel, who now will be posting the agenda for us. And I want to make sure, Allegra and I want to make sure that we have the agenda, any accompanying documents. 
so that then we have enough time, right, for when it, for when it gets posted on Thursday until we meet on Wednesday to then um, digest all the information, look at the minutes, right? The minutes will be there so that if we have any um, corrections to the minutes, then we can we can do those, all right? So that we're a little bit more formulaic and we get things, um, you know, done in a, a more efficient manner. Um, but yeah, we can continue forward, but so stay tuned, there'll be more uh, next month, okay? Thank you, Deborah, for that overview. Um, so tonight's agenda will include regular announcements, minute review, member reports, public comment, um, standing items, so updates from CREST, DEI, ROB, Youth Empowerment. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of space to talk about um, the election last week and that perhaps might tie into some of the annual goal discussion um there's also an item of speaker series discussion uh town council follow-up and then upcoming agenda items and meeting schedule anything not anticipated 48 hours in advance an additional public comment period and then that will be the end of the meeting um so does anybody have any announcements i do <laughs> anybody else or i'll jump in okay um a few things tomorrow night and there is a webinar with valley community development about the amherst community homes development which is the home ownership development that will be um, built in North Amherst. So that is at 6.30. Um, it is a webinar. The link is available on their website, um, which I don't have off the top of my head. But if you Google Valley Community Development, it will come up. Um, and then second, there is a town council meeting on November 18th. There are a lot of meetings and hearings scheduled for that night, but it will be part of it will be about the a public forum around the budget for next year. So it would be a good meeting to attend and speak in support of CRESS and DEI being funded in the budget. Um, there are additional asks that community members are making around school funding. Um, and then there will be an additional hearing um, about special appropriations because there was a five plus million dollar surplus from last year. So they are trying to allocate some of that funding to various capital projects. Um, so that those are all virtual as well as in person in the town room. And I believe that the first public hearing begins at 630. Um, I believe the first set of meetings is posted for five and they will be talking about the town manager goals during that period of time. So 630 could be a moving target. Um, but that would be again, as Deborah outlined the importance of the budget and having money for the things that we want to move forward. November 18th is probably one of the one of the key meetings for people to show up and advocate for. Um, so, um, Allegra, can you like after the meeting, if you have a chance, just uh, post a link to that? Um, mm -hmm. And you're saying like 630, but even though that might be a little bit of a moving target, that's what yeah. you said, the 18th? Yeah. Uh, also, the other um, areas that you might want to ask for is the Youth Empowerment Center, so the BIPOC-led mm -hmm. Youth Empowerment Center and the BIPOC Multicultural Center, which was the other recommendations, um, and also, um, you know, making sure that there's funding for the uh, Resident Oversight Board um, so that we can finally, hopefully, put those into, into fruition. Um, okay. Any other announcements? Other announcements? No, I don't have any that I can think of. 
Um, all right. So let's see. Meeting minutes from last meeting. Let's see. Deborah, did you have? Yeah, I had, I had a few. I, I had a few things to kind of a few corrections mm -hmm. um, to the minute. So I guess um, I'll I'll pose it to Camille. Like, so if we have corrections, how how does that work? Should I should we talk about it now? Do we talk about it now so that it can be updated and then we vote on it, or how's the situation? Because I do want us to get back onto the minutes because I know that that's been very sporadic. Um, you know, in terms of making sure that the public have, has the minutes of our, our meetings. But yeah, there's quite a few um, places where we need to have questions about and, and corrections on. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, uh, these were done off of the audio recordings. So that is where I'm just trying to figure out what what is it that you're looking for? Well, so for instance, so member reports, number two, it says Allegra said, talked about the parking app. I was the one that talked about the parking app, even though it was okay. taken off of the, I get it that you said it was taken off of the recording, but you know, part, you know, there's always mistakes that, that can be made. Um, then I didn't understand what the other bullet on the third one said, concerns from community members have been expressed in relation to CSWG's agenda. I had a question on that. I'm not sure what, what that means. Um, then if you go to number okay. seven, um, I can so, wait. Can I stop you for a second to make it a lot sure. easier? Um, I did not look at those minutes at all. Um, once they were done, they were sent on to Angel. Well, Angel did the minutes and then um, put them in. So um, if you want to email her with the questions afterwards, because I'm not sure how this works, in all honesty. I don't know. Pamela, do you know? Yeah, well, I mean, from from what I know is that basically if there's minimal corrections, then we just make them while we talk about it. But obviously, if there's more, then it, 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 it'll, be, it'll take a long time, right? So I, I don't want us to, to, to waste the time doing it. So I could send those to Angel, and then maybe we can just vote on it the next time, along with next uh, month's, so with along with this month's minutes, so we can do both, right? Um, and that's why it's so important. That's why I want us to get on a, on a schedule. So that mm -hmm. we, we have time to review these minutes, because then what I'll do if I have a whole bunch like I've had, I have this time, then um, I'll send it even beforehand so you all get it. And then, you know, it could be updated more more quickly and we can vote on it because the important thing is to vote on it and to, to have it be part of the um, on our, on our, on our page. So I, I think it makes sense to probably table them, send whatever, because it sounds like more than just uh let's change the name here but there are actually some questions about what things are referring to so yeah what... one or two one or two is that and then mm -hmm. some other ones is just um typos and yeah. different changes here and there that i noticed so yeah. would you be comfortable tabling it sending what corrections you have to angel and yes. then putting it back or on the angel. It in next next month okay yes next month not next year i apologize no, next, next month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh dear yeah. all right so we will table the minutes for now um next up is member reports so um i do have some um reports to make um so I think you all recall that that Legra and I had sent some questions to uh, the town manager, Paul Bachman, around the Youth Empowerment Center, around Resident Oversight Board, um, also just kind of like um, CSIJC getting support in terms of the work that we do so that we can you know move our work along. Um, so we had gotten some responses. We, we had sent out a round. We got some responses. Then we had follow-up questions. Um, and then we hadn't heard from Paul Bachman. And then he yesterday, oh no, today actually, he sent some some additional responses. Um, so of course, since it was today, we weren't able to 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 send it out to you all in, in time for the meeting to add it. Uh, but I'll be we'll be forwarding that along to you. Um it, it it didn't we didn't provide as much information, but he did provide some information. And when we do the crests and so on and so forth, I'll probably 
share some of what he said so that because it'll make sense to kind of talk about it at, at that point. But then, like I said, then um, Allegra and I will, will share those responses. Um, the other thing, too, um, so along with CSWG members, uh, Allegra and I, as CSA, CSSJC co-chairs, right? So it wasn't CSSJC, so we did not speak on behalf of the group. We spoke as CSSJC co-chairs. Uh, we've began this um, article series uh, that we, 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 we've we um, titled Equity Under Attack by Town Government. Um, and, it, and we started out with, you know, just information, questions, clarifications around the Youth Empowerment Center um, about four weeks ago. Then, then two weeks ago, we did one on the BIPOC Multicultural Center. Um, this week, you're going to see one come out around ARPA. So basically, every two weeks, it, an article is coming out. And then there'll be a few others uh, uh, coming out in regards to um, issues that, that the town is facing. That's obviously very um, dear to heart for, for BIPOC and, and, and folks around social justice. Um, also, Allegra and I uh, were interviewed by the Republican. It came out Mass Live, um, an article that just came out two days ago, and it's titled "After Floyd Murder, Amherst Panel Urged New Center for BIPOC Youth." It never happened. It's on MassLive.com. Um, I would have sent you the link, but if you go on your phone, you can get the full article. But if you go on the computer, then they say you have to sign in and blah, blah, blah. So it's just nonsense. But if you go on your phone, um, you can find the article. And basically that's again, talking about um, the fact that the Youth Empowerment Center has not been uh, founded um, after the recommendations that CSW, CSWG has had made back in 2021. Um, and we're still not getting clear answers in regards to when that is going to happen. Um, and let me see what else. Da, 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 da. Yeah, also, you know, invited the finance director. Uh, what is her name here? Um, da, 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 da. <sighs> Melissa uh, Zawitsky. Zawitsky. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying her last name wrong. Sorry if I'm messing up the last name. But Melissa to, to come um, talk to us because at the last meeting we were told that she was the one that was overseeing the Youth Empowerment Center in terms of the finance. And then uh, Ray uh, from from uh, Rec was kind of working on on it. So it's both of them who are kind of spearheading the Youth Empowerment Center. Ray came to talk to us last time, but um, Melissa, even though I've invited, we've invited her. Like when I have invited her, um, hasn't um, uh, responded to our invitation. So hopefully we'll get her to to, to meet with us um, in December. So I think that's all for now for me. Any other member reports? Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, um, and we had sent out an email about this, that Deborah will be our, the CSSJC representative um, for the resident oversight board panel um, that they have formed. So Deborah has graciously offered to serve as our representative on that panel. And um, I believe that work is starting next week. Is that correct? Yeah. So there's a, a three hour meeting actually <laughs> next Tuesday um, um, on, uh, yeah, on the 19th. And then there's another, I don't know if it's an hour two meeting on uh, December 10th. Um, and there'll be other uh, personnel from town uh, of Amherst, um, HRC rep, um, and then I'm not sure who else, but yes, some other representative. Oh, the police. I think someone from the police and so on and so forth. Is Camila's Cress also represented there? Oh. Um, all right. So meetings. Okay. Any other member reports? I am not seeing any virtual or live hands raised, so we can move along to public comment. We will have a public comment period at the beginning of the meeting and another at the end of the meeting. Um, if you would like to make a public comment, please use the hand raise um, function and we will bring you into the room. 
and we will not respond to any comments. We will just listen. Hello, I'm Martha Hanner, live in District 5 here in South Amherst. I'm speaking as an individual, but I'm also a member of the League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee. And so as I listened to everyone's introduction, I was so very impressed and humbled with everybody's uh, powerful experience and qualifications. And it makes me wonder, just I'll pose an open question uh, as you consider your goals. Your focus so far for this committee has been very narrow and very specific to the CSSJC recommendations, but with such a talented, diverse, powerful committee, uh, and as we look ahead to the next four years and particularly, say, the immigration questions and, and so on, I just pose as an open question whether it might at all be possible for you all to broaden your 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 goals at all regarding um, you know general racial justice impacts in our community. <laughs> and then the other thing I would like to say is that our uh, league's racial justice committee has a series that we call the Judy Brooks Conversations, approximately monthly on Zoom in honor of uh, Judy Brooks, where we invite various groups or organizations and so on that have some relation to racial justice locally uh, to uh, give a, re a Zoom presentation and then have open discussion and so on. Our next one, the date has not been set, but hopefully sometime in the next two or three weeks, uh, we, we have invited 80 acres to come and give us a presentation. So I will let you folks know when the date has been been set. And if you people have any suggestions of, of a topic that you think would be good for us to uh, use for a presentation, please, you'd be welcome to um, contact me or Milan Clark, who's the other co-chair of our committee. So thank you for all that you do. Thank, thank you, me. Martha. Um, I do not see any other hands right now for public comment. Um, there will be another period at the end. There are currently three attendees. If anybody would like to make a public comment, you can do so now or at the end of the meeting. Um, and we can move along then to updates from Cress and DEI and the Resident Oversight Board and Youth Empowerment Center. Camille, do you want me to go first or do you want to go? Okay. So, um, the DEI actually has a very we busy week ahead. Philip is going to be facilitating his first all staff workshop on implicit bias on Friday. On Sunday, the DEI um, office is going to be hosting the uh, Human Rights Commission, um, their annual retreat. On Tuesday, as uh, Deborah has already mentioned, the resident oversight board panel or advisory group is meeting. And then on Thursday, uh, the DEI office is hosting a Becoming Beloved community conversation on navigating differences. And concurrently, we'll be holding a space for anyone who'd like to talk about the election results. Um, uh, as uh, I previously mentioned, the resident oversight board panel or advisory group is going to be meeting on Tuesday with the consultants um, in town hall. Uh, the group will include directors from press, HR, and DEI, as well as representatives from police and fire and representatives from the HRC and CSSJC. The town manager has extended an invitation to a couple of community members to join that group, and he's awaiting their response to his invitation. Um, the DEI department uh, initiatives around youth empowerment, uh, uh, Philip and Melina have revised and um, updated the 
the youth survey um, that they that this board approved and reviewed last year that will be distributed to middle and high school students beginning on Monday. Uh, they're going to use the results of the survey to direct their initiatives for the year. Um, uh, they currently have already planned a five-week youth empowerment um, entrepreneurship program that would be in advance of the Amherst Global Village Initiative, where uh, youth will be um, will learn about um, entrepreneurship and will have the opportunity to produce some sort of good that they would be able to serve um, to sell at the Global Village, and then the other sec sections that they are uh, sessions that they're planning will either be civics or another topic that um, is expressed in the results of the survey. And so those are the three key areas from DEI at this point. So um, uh, Pamela, I, I know that Paul in his um, response to our questions um, is stating that you all don't need to um, write a report, but that would actually facilitate um, us being able to have information and know what is actually happening from month to month in terms of progress. Um, and so, you know, is at some point, are you all going to be able to provide us a report when you give us your updates? You're uh, in on mute. So the, the town manager's um, review of all of the other directors who are liaisons to boards um, found that no other directors are have been required to produce written documents that in the role of liaison, they are attending board meetings, providing updates. Um, and when there's information of, of some I will say of the word substance or um, to provide, then they are providing that, but they they have not been mandated to um, to re to provide a written document on a monthly basis. And so I you know I can send you the six sentences that I just stated, but there's you know there's nothing of substance to put into a report um, for this month. I'm sure that there will be months where there actually may be something of substance, but there isn't for this month. So, yeah, and I get that in terms of like, you know, what, what the town manager had said, but, you know, what we deal with is very, um, you know, critical issues that might be very different than what the other um, town um, committees deal with, because we're dealing with, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, social justice, um, you know, inclusivity, um, all of those very critical kind of areas where, you know, we've been pleading with you and Cress to, to get us something in writing so that we can actually see what the progress has been so that we can compare and contrast from, from month to month. Um, and even if others don't have to do it, given the critical importance of the work that we do, um, wouldn't that be, you know? Well, I, I, mean, I think there, that it's probably not worth debating whether this work is more critical than other work, because I'm sure that the other boards and committees feel that their staff liaison's work is equally as, as critical. But I think as far as work equity is concerned, as far as work load is concerned, requiring more of these two departments than is required of other departments does present actually an equity issue. Okay, well, if I have to convince you who's the DI director of the importance of the work, then, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I should move on. Um, so uh, I guess like what, what I wanna, what I wanna focus on then in terms of what you reported is um, the, the survey, because you said that we re reviewed the survey. I think this was a while ago. Mm -hmm. I think it was when the the other I don't know who was in there. So from... Asa and uh, Jennifer um, shared with this group last year a survey. You gave them feedback, 
they made the changes that were re asked by this group. And so that survey is being resurrected um, to be utilized again. Can can I can you share the survey again with us, please? Sure, I can. I will. Um, I I can ask Philip to do that. Mm -hmm. And then um and then I, I I do want us to monitor the 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 who like how many students um you know review response to the survey, what's going to be the outcomes of the survey. But I I do want this group to really look at this very closely since you all are going to use the survey to then, um, you know, create. The right, well, that was a recommendation of this group last year was to survey students. The The recommendation of this body was to um, have the programming be directed, self-directed by students. And by that, I mean that, that youth and students actually provide information to the DEI office about the types of programmings they would like to receive and that we could help uh, facilitate. So this is has been done at the request of the this body. Um, mm -hmm. And when the survey results are in, that would be something of substance that we could share. But as I just stated, they it hasn't been um, released yet and we'll, that process will start on Monday. Okay, and um, how long are you gonna be serving the youth and and by when will there be something of substance to, to share? So I, I mean, obviously with trying to get survey results from, a, from young people is something that will be ongoing um, because it's as, as with adults, having people respond to a survey is not a guarantee that you're going to get a lot of responses. Um, Philip will be here next month as it's our practice in DEI to alternate and since this is a project that he's leading, I'm sure he'll be happy to provide you with any update um, based on the information that he's gathered at that point. And um, so within, you know, at your next meeting would, would, would have been released for approximately uh, three to four weeks at that point. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Pat? Thank you. I was just wondering, Pamela, if it's possible to um, thank you for sounds like you're doing a lot of good things at the, in the department. And as I, you were talking, I was trying to jot things down and it was going pretty fast. I was wondering if it's possible to, I don't know, put a link or somewhere have the specific things, the six sentences written somewhere that we could, you know, easily access. Sure. So actually, we have been working with the new communications director, Sam Giffen, to update the um, website for DEI. And we are also have started on the uh, Human Rights Commission um, and the Disability Access and Advisory Committee. So some of this information is available now on the updated website. Um, and um, we will continue to revise and provide information there. Uh, can you just give a little bit more information about the Thursday event, the Navigating Differences? Um, where is that going to be and sure. time? So um, the Becoming Beloved series has uh, occurred bi-monthly, um, starting with the uh, National Day of Racial Healing. So starting with the January of last year, this will be, I believe, the fourth or fifth event um, this year. The events take place on the third Thursday uh, every other month in the Bangs Community Center Larry Room. Um, uh, so navigating differences will be uh, an opportunity for community members to participate in um, some skill building around consensus building and conflict resolution. And we will utilize studies that are based on actual events in the town of Amherst. Um, one, um, looking at the Jones Library renovation project. The second one, looking at the, um, the addition or creation of roundabouts at University Drive. Um, and those uh, events, those two case studies are used as examples for people to practice the skill sets that are provided in uh, in the beginning part of the of the workshop, there is um, 
information about the Becoming Beloved community on the DEI web site. Um, it's also on the town Canada on the town calendar with a registration link and um, encourage um, anyone who's attending to please register. So we have a fairly accurate headcount. Um, we do serve a light meal um, um, for the beloved community events. Uh, the facilitators for this these events were trained by Dr. Barbara Love um, last year in September as part of the liberatory visioning. And so this is one way in which we can facilitate or have them continue to use the skills that she, she taught them. Um, and so it's a mixture of both community members and a uh, town staff who act as facilitators for the conversation. The prior workshops earlier this year have included allyship and um, and then the the other workshop was on microaggressions and implicit bias, and then a third on America's racial history. So, um, so yeah, so this will be the fifth one that has occurred this year. And you said it was at 6.30? Six o'clock from 6, 6 to, to 8 p.m. on Thursday, the 21st. So Pamela, um, I have a, a, a follow-up with that. And and thank you um, for you all following up on one of the recommendations that CSWG had, which was racial healing and obviously, um, you know, contracting Barbara Love, which was one of the recommendations that, that we had made and things like that. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, one of the things, though, when we were envisioning this racial healing um, was that obviously it would be um, expansive. It would be um, to really start dealing with some of the root root kind of um, problems and issues, right? The the kind of root kind of um, anti-racism, um, structural racism, institutional racism within you know the town of Amherst, um, and that's what we envisioned it for. So I guess my question for you, um, because since we, we don't get data, um, is you said you, you, you all have had four, four sessions. Who, who, who's going to these sessions, I guess? You know, do you all have translators there? Um, you know, is there people from a variety of different back backgrounds? Um, you know, along with, you know, um, you know folks that, that are identify as white residents and stuff. Um, you know, what are the numbers? What's what's the kind of configuration of, of, of the folks that you all are getting going to, to, to these? Uh, so I would say that the the National Day of Racial Healing was probably the most widely attended with more than 30 folks attending. On average, we're between 20 to 30 people. Um, we have had some repeat um, attendees and some new attendees at each of the sessions. The sessions are... Uh, publicized on the town's um, community calendar the with the recent hire of the communications director. Um, you know that that position was vacant for almost a year. There are now being um, some press releases that have been done. Um, we have also uh, sent them out to our limited DEI mailing list as well as asked the facilitators um, to share among their networks. So, uh, you know, it's, a, I would say that it's a consistent group. Um, it's been diverse both in terms of race, gender, and age. Um, and uh, because we've been more consistent about holding the sessions this year, um, it's, I would, I would say that the trajectory is growing. Um, and do you all have translators there too? Uh, we have the pocket translators there. We've not had a need for to utilize them. Okay. Um, so so you'll have plans to kind of like continue to expand it um, in terms of the numbers and, and things like that? Well, the, the hope is always that it will continue to grow. Um, I think uh, we had envisioned initially um, are expanding on our contract with Dr. Love. And I think that is still a long-term goal, um, but it, it has not been realized yet, but it, we're hopeful that that will be realized this year. Okay. Erica. 
Thank you. Um, Pamela, thank you very much for um, your presentation. I'm curious, um, we are serving youth regarding what their needs are. How are you coming up with the topics for these wonderful um, bi-monthly um, discussions and skill building opportunities? So we, there, I would say that we've mostly been relying on our facilitators to think about the topics there. Um, um, and I have to go back a little bit in time. So uh, the initial sort of hope for Dr. Love was that she envisioned um, what was described as a three-part contract um, with the first providing training for the group of facilitators and then engaging with the town to through a series of um, liberatory visioning conversations that would be facilitated by the group of trainers. So we um, in year one or in year two completed that first uh, segment of having her provide in-depth training for the group of would-be facilitators. And then there was a lapse um, and I did not want their skills to go by the wayside. I wanted to keep this group engaged. And so we um, we did so by having them act as facilitators for this beloved community conversations. The um, So the facilitators have, uh, as a group, have decided on the topics that we've presented. And then at each of the, or at following each of the sessions, there's been a, a survey and evaluation form that's gone out to ask participants who respond what other topics that they um, would be interested in. And I think we were, we, we meaning the group of facilitators and myself, um, were tried to be very intentional about setting the programming for this year. So we started out with the National Day of Racial Healing that was followed by allyship that was um, followed by, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, National Day of Racial Healing, followed by microaggressions and Im implicit bias, followed by um, allyship, then a discussion around uh, America's racial history, and then following the election, trying to be intentional about uh, thinking about things, um, this the topic of navigating uh, differences, right? So looking at consensus building and conflict resolution. Oh, um, one clarification, Pamela, for, for the Human uh, Rights Commission retreat, um, can people attend um, or, or what's the parameters? So the Human Rights uh, Commission retreat is a public meeting because they will be meeting in a quorum. Um, and, um, so that is going to take place on Sunday, uh, from, I want to say 10 AM to, uh, the time that's set aside from 10 to, to, from 10 to five, but that, that has been posted as a public meeting and the, the time and hour and place are on the town's calendar. So people can uh, attend through Zoom, then that type of thing. It's, I just want to get the just it's, yeah. It's it's not it it's it would be in person. Oh, in person. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to get the the information. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Are we ready to move on to Cress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I am going to depart. Okay. Good night, Pamela. Thank you. Hey. Um, good evening and um, month seven. <laughs> Exciting. Um, a couple things I want to share with you. Um, as Pamela said, we now have Sam Giffen as our communications director. And with Sam's help, we were able to, if you look at the town of Amherst website, you will see it's police, fire, and now we have our own link right at the top. Um, for the Crest Department, and our page is active. Um, it, it goes over uh, how Crest was formed and the timeline up until, I think, this past summer when I came on. It also has all of our pictures and bios. Um, I'm really excited. 
we're also working with Samantha. We are working on an Instagram and a Facebook to get more out in the community. Um, as you know, young people use Instagram more than anything else. So that is something that we're really working on and excited about. Um, we are in the process of interviewing for new responders. And also with that, some of the other things that we're doing is we are building out our training program. Um, I have been looking at what folks were trained in originally, and I asked the responders what they felt was good, not so good, um, where they feel that they needed more information. And because this is so new, we've looked to like other departments um, and the trainings of like police and fire, um also we've looked at other um alternative response and it's very different for different response units as we are one of the few that is um we are not co-responders we are an independent um we are a standalone so um and actually we are meeting, we met with, um, well, I met with Amos from the LEAP um, report. And one of the things that they're working on is going through all of the alternative response and they're creating a map, but this one is going to be just for the departments that are standalone. So that's some really exciting information. Um, also, check my notes here. Um, we have had the relationship that Crest has with APD has grown. And in the past month, we had actually two in one day where we were called to um, scenes by, um, by calls that were put through to dispatch where um, APD needed our assistance. Um, so... Um, some of the other things that have happened is that we have used the pocket talk to speak to, um, help with a, um, neighbor who didn't speak English and needed some help with navigating the social services system. Um, and it worked really well. So there's a lot going on. We're trying to, we're still working on the SOPs. Those are taking a long time because there's a lot of information in there. And a lot of times what's happening is, is that because most SOPs are built from a paramilitary structure, um, we're trying to make sure that they are trauma informed. And also because we are consent based, it makes a difference in language and how we are writing these. So each one of these um, standard operating procedures, we hope will be at the end pretty extensive and cover a lot of things. What's happening now is we're finding out that as we're writing each one of these, that there are things that Crest deals with that um, being in the gray area that police and fire don't necessarily deal with. So, thank you. And also, I will be at the um, next week's DEI event. Um, one of the things that Pamela had spoke about was how people are dealing with the recent uh, election. And um, as an LCSW, um, I'm going to like hold space for people to talk about their feelings and just be able to be. Um, and I'll meet them where they're at. Oh, Everett, do you want to go? And then I'll, I'll go after I just have a, um, the, the calls that the police needed your assistance on. Are you able to tell us what those calls were about? Um, I can share a little bit. For one of them, there was um, a, a, a neighbor who had some um, a family emergency. And um, they needed someone there to be able to speak to this neighbor who was very, very upset. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do was hold space and be there. And I mean, it was at one point, um, the neighbor broke down and cried and just 
fell down to the ground sobbing. And the beauty about um, our training is, and that depending how comfortable you feel, the responder was able to sit there and just hold this person and give them a hug until they wanted to let go. And I mean, that is something that they're not going to forget that someone was there for when they needed them. Um, another one was that, um, i trying to think what the other one was, because it was the same day and at the same time, basically. Um, I can't think off the top of my head, but I do remember that one because I wrote it down. So th this call in particular <laughs> um, went through dispatch. Yes. Um, so it was a... Do you know what the initial request of the police was? Um, actually, it was police and fire. Yes, I do know. Um, it was a medical emergency. Okay. Okay. All right. That answers a lot of my questions. Um, you mentioned that the SLP that has been worked on now um, is being done trauma-informed. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So one of the things that we do differently is that when people are, everyone has a history, okay? So when we work from a trauma-informed lens, it's more about meeting people where they're at. So where you are in your life is going to be different than someone else. And we don't take like a standard one-size-fits-all um, approach to things. So it's about listening and speaking to people, you know, in their language or in their style more so. So it's like, I think of the difference of like, um, I always think your child, when you speak to your child, you speak in a different manner than say you would speak to your mother, okay, or another elder. And because we understand that everyone has different needs, those are the type of things that we can address with them. So I, I understand that. Um, is there any part of the SLP being written where um, there's more, there is not as much focus or there is a different focus other than social services? Because if I, I, I'm just trying to make sure that this SLP, that Cress, it's, it's not been written from a social service perspective, but an alternative to police response. So is mm. how, so what is that connection? Yeah. So it's about that gray area. So when you were talking about, so from an alternative response, again, when we think of things, we're talking about things that police don't need to be at. Somebody having, and a lot of it is kind of in a way like the social service e things so somebody who's having a, a mental health issue or if someone is suicidal you know being able to go in and calm somebody down and listen um i can okay we just friday actually had the meeting from the Bid, the business improvement district about the block party um and deborah and lissette were there i think you were there at the time i don't know if you remember the neighbor who was screaming about another neighbor who was in his space um and he was escalated and he continued to be escalated and someone came over to us and we saw him we were able to go over there and spend um a, a really good amount of time. We spent probably half an hour with him um, to de-escalate him. And the biggest thing that happened afterwards was he said that, thank you for listening. I actually felt heard. Um, because what happened was, is this neighbor wanted to commit physical violence on this other neighbor. And I had forgotten about it, um, but one of the members of the business improvement district made note about that. And he said that that was a huge difference than if a police officer had gone there to have a conversation and the police would not have been able to sit there and take the time 
to spend with this neighbor, to de-escalate him, to listen to him. And he must have said, and I was part of this, so he must have said the same thing about 50 times. And each time we heard him and we validated him. And that's the difference. So that is the difference of like a police officer coming in versus Cress. So it is, it is a lot of people skills. So in that place, that is that social part of it. So I, I, I do have to ask from the lens of um, the defense attorney, is, mm -hmm. there any, is there anything being written for Cress as to how to handle low level nonviolent calls from traditional police response? Like if there's a call for a noise complaint or trespassing or disorderly conduct, this is how you respond. So if it's someone, so it all depends. The biggest thing is how it comes in, okay? If it comes in as trespassing, that is a police matter. If it comes in, okay, and it also, there's some of the things about the language and how the call is taken by dispatch. So if it comes in that someone... So say the Jones Library, for instance, um, we have, um, there is a neighbor who will be on the side of the building, okay, and was there banging on the doors to be let in before the time that the library opened. So rather than call the police, they called us. Or one time the someone in the police station knew this person and called us because they felt it was not a police call. And that's where we were able to go over, just have a conversation and say, okay, the library, it's 8.30 now. The library doesn't open till nine and able to have a conversation with this individual to get them to understand the library doesn't open until nine. This is an elder too. So there was some, could be a, a cognitive issue. So that's the type of thing. Um, as far as like, I'm thinking like what they call a nuisance call, somebody screaming in the middle of the street, well, not in the middle of the street, on the sidewalk, we could also go over there and it's about being present. I mean, that's the biggest thing we are is we are present. We are there to listen. Um, when it comes to a noise complaint, that is a police matter. So if it comes in as a noise complaint due to the town gown, um, the Amherst is very, it's different. You know, a noise complaint could be a party with five people and it could be a party with a hundred people. So those are the type of things. And the other part of that is, is that if we, you know, a lot of times you have to remember going to um, a house or something like that, we are sending two individuals with um, no power to give any tickets. We can't give them fines. You know, all we can do is knock on the door and say, hey, you know, can you turn it down? And depending on the time or who's there, and then what? But that is that is not necessarily a bad thing. The the ability, the fact that you cannot give tickets or arrest people, that's actually a good thing. Um, it's because you, you I understand um you said that trespassing is a police matter and to an extent, I agree because it is a crime. Um, but I, I've had people who were charged with trespassing because they were sleeping in the parking lot off, um, what's that grocery store down the street? Um, stop and shop. Big y. Or, or, stop and or, shop. Mm -hmm. or, or Big Y. Not because mm -hmm. they were in the store doing something nefarious or bad, but because they were literally... They're trespassed from big white property. They had nowhere else to go. And so they had their shopping cart and they were sleeping in um, the parking lot. And I can tell you when the police show up, that person has been arrested. And mm -hmm. and it's it's wrong. Yeah. So, so I and in and, and that is totally what I'm saying like that is as um so like we have been called for big why of somebody being out there or something like that, that would be a crest call. The problem is, is once they call it, once they've been trespassed, you know, if they called and said, hey, um, there's this person there, can you come talk to them, move them along, etc." So what we would do in this case, 
would be, we have good relationships with like Craig's doors, okay? That is where the resources come in. Like being able to sit there and say, okay, what is it that you need? And somebody said sleeping in the parking lot. So being able to sit and call up to Craig's doors and find out if they have a bed for that person that night, or if they need a Salvation Army voucher, okay, or something like that. Those are the type of relationships that we're trying to work on. And it's frustrating because the way it is now, there are not enough beds for people. So if I could figure out how to house everyone, I'd be rich, you know. But in the meantime, all we can do is to talk to someone and to see what resources we can offer them and basically to move them along. And I know that's that's not the answer that people are really looking for, but we're trying to do what we can with the means we are given. Actually, what you said is part of the response that people are looking for. Because if you go, if Crest goes, you are going to do all those things. If the police go, they're going to be handcuffed. No. Well, and that's why we're really working on the relationship with the police, okay, so that they see something like that or someone calls them and they say, okay, you know, go down their list and say, you know what, this is not a police call. This is a Crest call. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and I think that's where I want to kind of pick up. Thank you, Avril, for those um, questions. And thank you, Camille, for answering um, the questions. And I think that's where I want to pick up with with my questions and, and why, you know, we've been kind of like, you know, for months now um, talking about this. And I understand, Camille, that you're new, um, but obviously Crest has been in place for two years now. And we're hearing rumblings of people, uh, you know, basically starting to say, why is Crest there? And so on and so forth. So for us, the reason why we 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 ask you these questions and why we want Crest to be a, an actual alternative to policing is because we want you all to be the best possible, right? But we want you all to be the essence of what it was that you all were created for, which was after the George Floyd murder and after you met after Amherst said Amherst said that they were going to deal with, with um, racism within their structures of town government and wanting an alternative to policing program. So, so for Crest, that's where we want you all to focus on. So we do, we do want you to show up to those, right? But not just because you're building a relationship with the police and they feel like, oh yeah, let's bring Crest in, but also because they have to bring Crest in, right? Not just because they found it within the, the, the goodness of their heart to bring Crest in, but because they have to, right? Because there's certain certain issues and certain incidents that are nonviolent, right? That needs to be, maybe not necessarily non-criminal, but nonviolent that needs to be addressed. So even a trespass, as what Avril just discussed, you know, might be criminal, but still nonviolent, right? Because the person is sleeping. Right, and, the okay. Well, let me finish. Let me finish, please. Okay. Let me finish, and then you can you can jump right in. So for me, that's why the same question I asked for Pamela, I will ask for you, and that's why we need the breakdown and in terms of the categories that are included in terms of what Crest is responding to, and what calls are nine one one dispatch calls, what calls are coming for towards a crest number and what calls are being referred to the, from other departments and then we want the back we want the breakdown right we want community outreach we want assist citizen we want community engagement we want whatever follow-up means so we need definitions we want administrative this business agency assist apd which was some of the categories you all had but then we also want well-being check noise complaint disturbance suspicious suspicious motor vehicle mental health medical domestic citizen transport any animal complaints we want those other things, which was what leap. So, okay, so I will tell you this now. Um, APD has an animal officer, so those are not us, okay? And a lot of those character ca categories that were in leap were decided that they were not crest calls. So as far as it goes to the calls that were that we are responding to, they are all on the website. The so ones who, we're who going decided, to. Who decided that they were not crest calls? They were already there when I was there. When we looked at the what they are, the okay. the twelve or I'm like I'm going off the top of my head, but the ones that we do go to. 
So but, like, but domestic, that's the thing. But like, domestic, the minute you said domestic, a domestic is no, there's a domestic is automatically, okay, two police officers, okay, because domestics can escalate quickly. All right. So I understand some of like you called the lower level ones, like the trespass, et cetera. Now, when it comes to things, you have to understand, I can't make another department call us. So it has to be, it has to come from what we are doing now. And it is, as I said about the relationship, it is getting to understand and get the standard operating procedures in place so that we are covered and that dispatch and the APD know these are the calls that Crest will be going to. All right. Now, until those are in place, right now it is basically on the relationship we have on what is called in of what we go to. And while I would love to say that, you know, two years is, you know, so long and everything else, in the realm of um, alternative response, we are right on track targeting where we are now. Well, I mean, maybe you are, but I think for the community, it's not right because for the it may not be for the it may not be for the community, but you have to understand it takes time to do things, and nothing happens overnight. And even if this report was written four years ago, five years ago, that was the report. The actual standing on the ground, and it has been said before, we are building the plane as we're flying it. So things come up weekly that are changed that we understand. Okay, well, you know what? Here's what happened. And every day when, after we go to a call, the next day we go and do a debrief about what calls we went to, okay, and how we could better handle things. And what you have to understand is, again, we're dealing with human beings and everyone is different. And how things happen one day is not necessarily the way things are going to happen the next day. And it is a huge learning curve because alternative response is new. So there is no blanket way to deal with things. It's not like the police where they say, okay, this person has a gun. This is how you deal with it. This person who has a mental health problem could be very different than the next person who has a mental health problem. So there are no ways to actually sit there and say that every call should be handled this way. And that is why we're trying to work through things so that we do things in a way, so that the way we handle ourselves is in a way that is the best for the community. So Camille, uh, no one's saying that uh, every call is going to be handled the same way. Um, what what I'm trying to impress upon and and what I had same question I had made to Pamela and I'm asking for you is because you know we need transparency right so right now it's still you know we keep hearing the same information from month to month we're not hearing anything different we're hearing you know you know the same thing so until you provide us with some data that we can actually compare from month to month and also add these, because this is the first that I'm hearing that you're saying, oh, all these other um, aspects, all these other incidents that were in LEAP have, have just been set aside. And now it's only, uh, you know, those that, that I don't know who decided. You can't, you can't go to everything. You could, this is a new department. Okay. You can't start a new department and say, okay, here, we're going to go to this broad range of things. What's happening is we have, we're trying to narrow what we're going to. Okay. Get that, get everything in place for those. And then in time grow and build. You can't just sit there and say that someone's going to go to every type of call when there is no precedent. Uh, well, you just said it's a new department, so you create. It is a new department. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, you, either you have it one way or the other. You know what I'm saying? It can't be both ways. So It's a new so department, so you can't go to everything. And you cannot sit there and go, okay, well, we're going to go to this, that, and the other. Right now, it was already decided before I got there that the calls that we were going to go to. So okay. I but am I'm building. To I to challenge that. The challenge. I am. No, I'm going to start with what I have, 
and go through and make sure that the standard operating procedures that we are trying to build have those in mind before trying to go and do all this other stuff. And there is enough on the plates of the responders now to do this work. Okay. And um, how many responders are there still? Four. And when are the uh, uh, new ones possibly going to come on board? Uh, we're still interviewing. So we're trying to plan on um, getting uh, two for uh, hopefully December. All right. Allegra, you had some questions? Yes. Um, so to kind of go back to the idea of data, because um, I did just look at the Crest website and I didn't see anything about like call logs or anything like that. I know that's something that they're, they're... not on there. Oh, okay. no. I'm sorry. I thought so that again, said that they were. Uh, no, 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 no. Not the call lines. The call types are on there. Okay. So the thing about it is, is that we um, recently and it still hasn't been signed, but we're waiting on the DPH grant. OK, so right now we were working with Qualtrics and we just got the contract signed again to continue working. And there are other things that came up that we want to add into our um, our data. One of the things that will be coming up. So we are ahead of the amount of data that we're trying to collect. So we're trying to do some things like how long it takes um to get to the call, uh, call duration. So some of those things have been captured in CAD, but also CAD has been built for police and fire. So that's the type of thing that we're trying to work with Qualtrics so that we can capture data that is more beneficial to the work that we're actually doing. So again, once... there's the qualitative and the quantitative. Right. So once Qualtrics, the kinks are worked out, you're getting what you want. Is it like a way, can you hypothetically you like run a report that would that you could specify like parse out each call type per month so that it's not you sitting there tallying everything but it's the computer doing it so that there would be eventually some tangible data that, that that's my hope yeah so at least at least on the basic calls that should be able to be done mm -hmm. so. and then my... again but the biggest problem the problem that you know calls don't and that's, I think that's the big thing that people are missing in this work, that being people centric, okay, that the amount of time that we spend on calls is a lot longer than, say, police or fire. They come in, get what they need, and are out. We come in, provide a service, okay, um, like say the, the person who was having difficulty um, and police called us. After that call was over, Okay, the next day, we also would go back and that's what's going to be added into this form is going back and checking on the person. So, um, and other, what other referrals do these, our neighbors need? Okay, so if they're having um, food insecurity or something like that, and, you know, rather than going to the store and, you um, uh, shoplifting. There's an alternative. And that's what we're trying to work with is trying to find. So we're trying to get to people. Some of this work is we're getting to people before they need to be involved with the police. And, and I understand that. And I appreciate that. And I know that like numbers don't tell the full picture, but I think some people, including myself, are feeling like we're not getting a number or a picture, really. And and that's partly where I think some of the frustration lies, um, be, because I I do think that we'd like to see, you know, what what is the community utilizing Crest for and, and where is that coming from? Like, is it coming from self-referrals? Is it coming from police saying, you know what, this isn't really a good role for us. Let's call Crescent because I, I think we want to get a better sense of how effective Crest is being and what else it needs in, in order to live up to its best potential. Um, but I did have another question about the training. I know you said you were speaking with some of the original responder or some of the responders who have been through the training, some of whom have been there since the beginning is my understanding, looking at the website. Um, so 
my again understanding and speaking with kind of members of the implementation team back in 2022 was that they, there was really a concerted effort to try and whenever possible use really like liberatory groups or frameworks for training so bringing in people like wildflower alliance people with lived experience people um i believe it was astoya key who did some training around suicidality um and and trying to you know if if they were my in in talking with earl i remember him talking about having somebody coming in who was living, you know, who had an autism spectrum diagnosis talking about some ways to work with people who have autism. So trying whenever possible to lean on the lived experience of community members who have had interactions with the police or who have had interactions with psychiatric um, systems to kind of get a better understanding of what that experience is like. So I'm wondering if that's still something that will be incorporated into the training. Because I, I think that's, in my mind, what sets Cress apart and makes it an alternative to policing is that you're not having the paramilitary structure of standard operating procedures. You're not having, um, you're, you're thinking more trauma-informed. And I think the most trauma-informed thing is to really work with people where they are and, and have an understanding about what that experience is like when you're building the program up around somebody. So I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. So, and I totally agree. The clinician in me is very much like the thought, my, that is my whole thing, meeting people where they're at. And one of the things that we're working towards is trying to make sure that we are not taking people's lived experience for, um, for granted. So um, trying to find out ways so that we can compensate people for coming in to talk to us so that it's not just, you know, we're taking someone who is unhoused and talking about their, their mental health and just saying, oh, hey, come on and teach us all this about you and then go. You know, I don't think that's fair. And I think that um, the Black community as a whole, it is... I've always felt that it is does not rest on us to train others, okay? And a lot of times that is what happens is that the BICOC community is asked to train others for no compensation. So, and that is a really tricky thing to do, but I'm trying to figure out ways through the DBH grant to make sure that people are compensated for um, their time and their effort and their lived experience. Erica? Thank you, Deborah. Um, thanks, Camille. Um, I'm interested in knowing the DPH grant, you mentioned that twice now, um, how much of that supports the mission and goals that were original for Crest and how much does it push you beyond those goals? Um, a lot and a lot. Okay, so um, the DB, so half of the DPH grant has to go out into the community. Okay, so a lot of things that we're looking at are trainings, and it's also going to support. Um, we'll be looking to um, request for proposals, RPFs, um, for things that we are looking for in the community. So things like um, working with the unhoused population, um, mental health, um, doing some trainings with the community. So um, some of the things we've talked about are, so in, in conjunction with things like with DEI, about racial equity, et cetera. Um, Barbara Love, I mean, part of that we had talked about getting in speakers to come in to talk about um, lived experience and just learning. But it's also to provide for things that Crest needs and but all that still is kind of up in the air because we still haven't gotten everything signed. But we're starting, we've been promised it, so. Camille, um, I guess changing topics a little bit, um, has there been any other discussions around the Youth Empowerment Center? Because I know you and uh, Philip 
Philip had been at some of those meetings? So um, I'm trying to think of the last one. Um, no, I think that the thing about it is, is that they're still working on what's going to happen. And I know like DEI is doing some programming. Um, and uh, as, as far as like a, as programs, um, things are happening with programs. As far as a center, I don't know about that. Um, I do know under the original ARPA grant that part of the grant was that we had to work with youth um, and there we have set up to start in January, um, age six to 12 in partnership with, um, oh, I'm trying to think some of the housing. Um, one of the house, two of the housing that have community rooms, um, we're working with some of the parents there and the youth there to do some reading um and activities with a healthy snack so those were all part of the original arpa that um we're finally able to be able to do but as far as the center you don't have any updates in regards to that no i don't okay all right so we'll continue to i guess talk to ray and um melissa the finance director there to find out more information Any other questions for Camille? May I ask again, um, in terms of funding, the department is not only funded by the DPHU grant, correct? There is, you, it, it is an official town department and it is part of the town's budget. Budget. The budget just covers the responders, myself, and um, uh, the responders and myself. The DPH grant or the ARPA grant covered the implementation manager and the administrative assistant. Okay. And if I can go back to the SOPs that you're working on, and, and and I do understand um, the foundation that you're trying to build and be new into this role and being only there now for um, seven months. Um, do you, by sense of what you've been doing now for the last seven months, have a sense of what is a, a reasonable time frame to say, okay, um, my SOPs are here and may be completed by this time? So... My hope is that our part of the SOPs are completed before the end of the year, okay? Um, at least, you know, a good portion of them. And then they have to go through um, uh, they have to be approved by APD. Um, we have to go over them with dispatch and then they have to go through um, the um, KP law and the town council. I don't know if they have to go through town council, but I know they have to go through the town manager. KP, KP law is town council. Um, yeah. What, just for clarity, why would they need to be approved by APD? Because dispatch is part of the APD. So... So dispatch, so um, by the chain of command, dispatch is under the police department. So again, everything is balanced. So it's not something that I can just say, okay, you know, go to the dispatchers, um, go to the supervisor and say, hey, you have to do this. Um, he answers to APD. He answers to the chief. So given that it has to be, reviewed and approved by APD. Is there any collaboration now that has been written with APD to say that we're, you know, given that this, at the end result, you guys are gonna have to review this, let's work on it together now. Therefore, when there's an end product, you guys don't take it, review it and say, you gotta start over or you gotta remove all this stuff. Is there any collaboration right now? That's actually what happened originally is that the original SOPs were too simple. 
okay, that they were taken and that's what ended up happening. So what we've done is we have taken APD's um, rules and regulations and that's what we're doing is going through them okay. to make sure that, so we're, we're basing them Say basing them on, but at the same time, they're crest. So in this way, we're all speaking the same language. So that if they call and say, well, I mean, the, the biggest difference is like they, they, in fact, they were actually talking about changing citizens versus we call um, our folks neighbors. I'm sorry, there's language that says citizen? Yeah, theirs is citizen, like... Um, like citizen transport, where we're like neighbor transport, like that. I'm just saying like basic language. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commander. Do we have any other questions for Camille? I have one. <clears throat> hi, Camille. Hi. Uh, hi. So you have currently the program right that was created two years ago you said um are you once you have your operations set in place for certain programs like right for certain types of calls would you be willing to pick up or readdress the types of calls and or like advocate for taking on different types of calls if possible yes Yes. So the biggest thing that we have is, is that um, we also have a very young department. Okay. And the training, that is why it's so important to get our training um, together is because whereas police and fire go through an academy. Okay. And I'm trying to build this so that in the future, it's, um, laid out in like the same mannerism so that people who come through Crest training are trained to that high standard so that it's not something that, um, that if a call comes through that they know how to handle it. Right now, the way things were, there was no real written standards until the interim team came in. And that's when all of the, the original procedures came into effect. The inaugural director did not believe in having written standards. Um, and that is, you know, when the um, interim team came in, they started putting these things into place with the idea that it would only go so far because they were only supposed to be in place for a short amount of time. That ended up being a little bit longer than they figured. So... That's it. I have a quick, thank you. I have a quick question. Um, are you getting any support in developing these SLPs and moving them forward? Because um, I'm just looking up uh, and I'm looking at 62% of the largest 50 cities actually have an alternative response um, where they work with dispatchers. And I know a lot of the issues are legal issues, HIPAA issues. Um, and, you know, liability issues. And that's, you know, towns tend to be extremely conservative, town staff tend to be extremely conservative, a town manager, uh, extremely conservative about their liability. So I'm wondering, um, has, you know, KP Law, anybody provided any support for you around getting these together um, so you can move them forward more quickly? And that would require, you know, you having the ability to work with the chief as well. Um, I mean, I think doing it alone is is crazy. Well, and we're not doing it alone. Okay. So it's it's a balance of trying to balance between the needs of um the the neighbors in Amherst with um APD, with um Cress, and also with like the LEAP report. And um, it's actually interesting that tomorrow there is a, um, via Zoom, and we're attending um, LEAP talking about liability. So um, that is a huge part of it. And there have been numerous reports that come out, but there is this big fear that, you know, we're going to do something as a whole 
and somebody's going to get sued behind it. And I know that the previous supervisor for dispatch, that that was a huge concern with him. Um, the new um, dispatch supervisor is very much on board and wants this all done because he believes in Crest and he believes that this is something that we can work together to do. Anything else? <laughs> yeah, uh, do we have any other questions? If not, we can let Camille go because we know it's a yeah. late <laughs> night. And you can just pass the, the the hosting to Allegra, okay, Camille? It's already set. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Right. Have a good Thank night, you. folks. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, um. So I believe next on our agenda, we wanted to also kind of just provide a space for the committee to share anything that's coming up in the wake of the election um, and kind of put that out there. Um, I mean, I'll just say that, you know, from, from my perspective and what I've heard from people already across the state. Um, I know Donald Trump did not invent racism, homophobia, xenophobia, anything like that, but I've I've heard multiple stories from people since last Wednesday of, of people coming up to them on the street and saying, I voted for Trump and you're going to go back to where you came from, you know, expletive, expletive. So I just want to name that there is possibly a surge of hate happening right now um, and that the people that are always most impacted are the people that this committee is meant to advocate for. Um, and I just, I just want to say that. Um, so if anyone has anything that they would like to share. I think we should try and educate people that, um, there are hate crime laws on the books and even locally, I have seen them enforced in local courts. Um, most notably um, recently with the, the protests, um, Palestine, Israel, I've seen hate crime charges being brought in Belgium town. Um, so it, people should not be intimidated. Um, people should not be scared and people should um, speak up I know that there is um, anxiety among a lot of people, um, especially around um, our immigrant community. One of the things that Massachusetts has done, and I believe have done very well, is that they do not allow local authorities, so to speak, to cooperate with ICE. Um, it's We've had issues where ICE used to go into courts and get people, take out people. And I think that was addressed by um, the state and the courts and lawyers who work in the courts. And I think we have guidelines and provisions in the books. That is not to say that somebody won't call ICE um, and you know people get detained. One of the things that um, people should understand is that um, if you're detained by ICE, you become lost in a fog um, because one of the big detention centers that we have here is in Burlington, Massachusetts, but there is nothing that says they have to bring you to Burlington, Massachusetts. They can bring you to Colorado or to New Mexico. Um, ICE is federal. There is nothing that keeps you in Massachusetts. Um, there's also um, certain things that people get charged with that um, used to be issues when it comes to immigration. Um, laws continue to change. So not everything is a deportable offense. And people should understand that as well. Um, one of the big ones, I believe, is OUIs. Um, we live in a college town where people get a lot of OUIs. Um, yes, felonies. People get If you get arrested and charged a felony, you are going to be a target. 
of um, ICE. It does not mean that you have no rights, um, but people should fully understand that just because they say they are going to do something does not mean that you don't have laws on your side that can help you. There was a lot done when he was president the first time, and there was a lot that was undone when Joe Biden became president. Um, but as if you've been paying attention, the people that he's appointing are people that are trying to roll back what Biden did. Um, so it will be challenging, it will be difficult, but you still have rights and you want to be very vocal about that. Um, and again, just because you're arrested does not mean that is the end of it. Um, tell people to ask questions. Um, you're always guaranteed counsel, um, especially in criminal matters, not necessarily some matter, but criminal matters. And for a lot of people that we deal with, they cannot afford attorneys and therefore they appoint court attorneys. But one of the great things about um, the Masters of Public Defender's Office is that they have an immigration impact unit. So if somebody gets arrested um, who's not a citizen, um, your attorney or their attorney can reach out to the immigration impact unit that will give them advice on the immigration status and how to navigate the criminal charges so it doesn't put that person in more legal jeopardy with immigration. So again, um, it's I, I think that's more, more now than anything it's um people should you know like tell the community pass on that information i i remember there were moments when you know i believe people were getting cards with numbers on there i think we may have to resolve go back to that um we have their rights printed on cards so they fully understand in their language know what's going on um but it's it is yet to be seen what's going to happen but I know that um, in my circle in the criminal world, there's conversations about how to go about and protect um, our clients, especially those who have um, immigration issues, so to speak. Yeah, thank you, Avril. I mean, obviously that is, you know, incredibly important information uh, to share, uh, especially, you know, given what, most likely is going to be coming down the pike in regards to immigration. But I think like in terms of, um, you know, this new administration coming in, it's just, it's going to be across the board. It's going to just be immigration. It's going to be immigration. It's going to be one of the areas. It's going to be diversity, equity, inclusion. It's going to be LGBTQIA+. Plus. It's going to be, you know, all these other, you know, it's going to be climate. It's going to be, you know, you name it. And it's, it's going to be there. Um, and then in terms of immigration, the other part, too, is for, um, you know, young people who have, you know, parents who possibly are undocumented. People are going to be afraid that they might get found out, right? So they're not going to get services. They might not tap into health care. They might not tap into other social services so that they don't, um, um, you know, certain family members don't get separated and things like that. So it's going to cause you know, just problems upon problems upon problems. And like you said, the fear, right, is going to be very palpable, um, even though there will be great attorneys like you and others out there to help, but how many are actually going to access you out of fear, you know? And so I think that is one of the things is how can you, right? How can you share? Because that's why we do this, this, this meeting, right? Is to share knowledge, is to combat, you know, fear, intimidation, because a lot of what this administration does is intimidate to and create this type of chaos um, so that people, you know, deny themselves. And then obviously if they deny themselves, they can end up getting ill. And then obviously a lot of them can end up, you know, having even worse situations, um, you know, leading from, from there. So, um, and then also just kind of like, you know, for me as a black woman, just like the, the message, right, that it was, in terms of you know a black uh, an an Asian woman running, um, and you know two women having run against him and lost, um, and then Kamala losing you know across the board, whereas at least um, a Hillary won the popular vote, and then a white male running against him winning, 
um, it, it just doesn't like bode well in terms of this nation, right? And and what Allegra was talking about, right? We're starting to see already just the emboldening of people feeling that because he's in office, now I can do whatever it is that I want to do, right? Go back to your country. We've been seeing Confederate flags are popping out all over the place. And this is just the beginning, right? He's not even in the office yet. He's just appointing his people and we're seeing the people he's he's appointing, right? The, the, the caliber of people he's appointing. So um, we are gonna have to share a lot of knowledge. We are gonna have to come in community. We are gonna have to unify and we are gonna have to um, band together for these next four years because we are a, a difficult situation. Pat? Oh, yes. Um, thank you. So I think our meetings are two hours. Oh, yeah, that's our, an estimate, but it usually doesn't end at two hours. Oh, <laughs> you wow. should continue on and on and on. So whoever yeah. needs to go, though, you, you can, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I allocated two hours. And I, I'm okay. just, I have a question about the agenda because I sure. know we... We passed over the annual goal discussion, so I was hoping that we would get to some goals. But anyway, it you know number four. So my question is, how do we deal with the agenda? Because that was number four. I was wondering about that. Yeah, and I'm gonna have to leave shortly. Okay. Alagra, do you want to take that one, or do you want me to respond? So I think we have some time management concerns coming from. Um, our staff liaisons as well. So I know that they have typically allocated until eight o'clock for the meeting, which is why we tried to move them up um, to give their presentations first. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we have a lot of questions for them and the answers um, does take a lot longer than sometimes what we have allocated for. I think we, wanted to have the discussion of goals as well this evening because it's been something that we've put off a few meetings because of time constraints um but let me let me interject i think yeah. like one of the things especially for, for new members is that you know obviously there's standing items right like in terms of press updates di updates you know what's going on with the youth empowerment a resident oversight board um, we don't even get the multicultural center, but, you know, that should also be part of the updates and things like that. So those are kind of standing items. So we we are, and we have begun. So just so you all know, it's not as if we haven't talked about goals. We have begun that discussion. Actually, two meetings ago, we started going over goals and talking about speaker series and things like that. But it's a, it's a big topic, right? So one of the things that I know, Erica, you had brought that up. One of the things we might want to consider because we have these standing items is doing some type of retreat or maybe just allocating a meeting, right? So not taking away, we still would have a meeting like this, but then adding another meeting where we actually just dedicate to like goal setting and things like that, because we're not going to be able to do goal setting in like 10 minutes, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, so I, I think that that will probably be, um, you know, the, the way for us to go with that. So my suggestion would be if we could, um, cause I know Pat, you know, you need to go is to, if you can, if you can send some, some dates, right. That you might be available to, to Allegra and I, and then we can try to figure out another date for us to, to schedule a meeting that we can just kind of dedicate the goals. And then Erica, I know that you had some ideas around a retreat and that might be something even, you know, more kind of, you know, intensive, but at least we could dedicate a meeting to the goal setting. And, and that's what I wanted to speak to is to really think about having a retreat, especially that I think the committee now has the majority of its members. Um, you guys have been, you know, sort of leading the charge uh, for a while. Um, and I think, you know, having Pat and I really make sure that we're on board with understanding what's happened in the past and where we can help move it forward, um, as well as I think um, since it's a small group here, um, I'm I sometimes feel that um, that's I'm not clear about 
CRESS and DEI. I mean, I've read the reports, I've read the recommendations, but where they're going and where we want it to go. Um, so I think a retreat might be very, very helpful. Just sort of all of us being sort of on the same page. We may not have the, you know, come out with the, the same directions of how to get there, but at least understand where we want to go as a committee and what we expect. Um, so I, I really think, you know, having an opportunity to have a retreat, um, at, I think would be very helpful um, and in person as well. Um, I mean, I, I get the sense sometimes that the staff is very defensive when questions are asked um, and we're, we have the same goal as they do. I mean, I keep on hearing from everybody here is we want to support you, but we need to have the information in order to advocate for you. We need to understand where you are and we need help. Uh, and that sometimes is seen more as a challenge for them. So, um, I think a retreat might be really helpful for all of us to be on the same page and to think about how we can support each other moving forward, especially at this time. And I just wanted to add, there is going to be a Women's March um, January 18th in Washington, D.C., which, of course, not everybody can get to or go to, um, but um, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there with my sister and my niece. Um, it just, I think it's just so important. And I've already had people tell me it's going to be dangerous. It's like, you know, life is dangerous. Um, you can walk down the street and somebody can just smack you in the face because of who you are. So um, I just wanted to share that there will be a, a Women's People's March on the 18th. Can you please share that with our group too? Because, you know, Absolutely. that, that you know, would be important for us to, to know. Because like I said, I mean, He's going to impinge. I didn't even get to right because there's so many issues that 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 this administration is going to pinch upon. I didn't even get to our bodies, right? Controlling women, controlling their own bodies. I mean, we can't even do that anymore. So, um, and you know, the fact that there's no checks and balances in place, right? We have those three bodies that are supposed to check each other. Right now, those three bodies are totally under you know one control. Um, uh, per se, and you know, according to what we're we're hearing, there might even be more chance of of this administration making recommendations for more um, Supreme Court justices during this four year period. So, yeah, be a uh, be an interesting uh, few years coming up for me. Not saying another word that I really want to say, but I won't say. <laughs> but I wrote. I, I had a thought about um, time management and the agenda. And I, I know it may be a challenge for town staff, but yes, town staff leaves us at 8.30 and at times we go on. My thought was that we do two meetings a month, um, two hours each committed. One meeting we have for DEI and CRESS updates and anything that can fit into that. And the other meeting we have for everything else and exclude DEI and CRESS updates from that meeting. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be an idea. Oh, I mean, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I think as much as it can be hard to get seven people's schedules together or 10 people's schedules together, I do think that we spend so much time on Crescent DEI at every meeting that it almost seems like every month we're pushing something off. Um, and I do think that there, I, th I think that if we're talking, you know, one of the goals we discussed at one point was maybe having a speaker series or even just when we're trying to have guest speakers come in and, and then we have that person and then Cress and then DEI, then anything else is really out the window. So I, in, in thinking about like getting stuff done in the committee and time management, like that seems like it would be the most realistic option, um, even if it means finding more time to commit. Um, and just to be mindful of people's schedules, I'm not suggesting we start it now. It's okay. like it to be a new calendar year. So maybe, yeah. you know, just announce it, ask for it. And then we say, okay, um, maybe our what is this december january february start in march i like that's four months for people to, people to adjust um around mm -hmm. schedules i mean if it can be done um earlier than march great but at least we afford time for people to say okay we're now going to two committed two hour meetings a month yeah <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Erica, that's a good idea. Um, I just want to suggest this. It's just really a brainstorm. Um, but um, so I was a co-chair of a committee and we actually met with town staff um, to think about the agenda and to get updates from them and then be very clear about what we wanted uh, them to update uh, to our members versus what we were gonna share with our members, um, just to make it concise, because sometimes we had meetings where we had town staff just going on and on about things that we actually didn't wanna hear about and the things that we did wanna hear about, they weren't talking about. Um, and so we were able to you know, have a smaller meeting with town staff just to be clear about what we intended in what we wanted. Um, so that's just a suggestion. I know that the offshoot to that is, is that I know this, this committee wants to be as extremely transparent to all attendees in terms of the community as possible. So that might not be a good thing in terms of doing that, but it might help um, shape the agenda. And um, sometimes I just really feel that, you know, the questions you ask, and you've asked before that there just seems to hit a wall. <laughs> and so I wonder sometimes if a smaller meeting with you two co-chairs with the town staff might be helpful in between. So that's just one thing. Um, the other thing is, is the minutes. I was a little surprised that the minutes don't go to the co-chairs first before they get sent out to everybody else. Um, they're draft, they're always draft. Um, and the rest of um, the members as well as community members can um, make comments when it comes up to reviewing them and um, voting on them. Um, but um, I constantly had to check grammar and, and uh, accuracy in terms of who said what. Um, so I'm just very surprised because, you know, that's, you could reduce the amount of time because the two of you know what was said and who said it. Um, with regard to just going over them. Um, so um, if there's any resistance, it's happened in other committees. There's no reason why the person who drafts the minute, who is not a, really the, the director of a department, the person is assisting, um, why you shouldn't, the two of you shouldn't be able to review them before they get sent out as draft minutes to the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. I like that idea um, to speak to the first comment that you made. I think part of our thinking around asking for like the written update as part of the packet prior to the meeting was that so we wouldn't have to sit through like the oral update. We would already come on the same page with the information, which is why I'm feeling frustrated that we can't get anything in writing. Um, because I think that that could eliminate some of the time that's spent on providing an update and can get more into the, the questions around some of the data. Um, because at this point, there's not even data being presented. So um, I, you know, I think perhaps Deborah and I can ask if that would be an alternative um, and we can see if that's something she would be willing to do if we can all find the time to do that together. Um, but. Well, I mean, I mean, for me, I, I would, I would say for uh, like these are all good ideas, and I think we want to kind of, you know, marinate and and think about them, um, just because you know, obviously, you know, we we we've, we've been banging heads with with the um, town staff, and we've tried different things. I mean, even the things that we get now, Erica, is is because behind the scenes. Allegra and I are like, can you all please do the, the <laughs> so the minimal things that we get is because behind the scenes, we've been communicating and saying, can you please do this? Can you please get that? And, you, you know, and, and, you know, this is as much as we've gotten, because that's the thing that they don't understand is that if they would give us a report, right, and we would look at the data, we could just focus on that as opposed to since we're not getting anything, then we have all these 10 million questions, right? <laughs> because we're not getting anything prior to, right? Because if they sent us those things prior to when we had a time to look at it and digest the information, you come in with one or two really specific questions, right? Boom, boom, as opposed to 10 questions that I might have because, you know, I don't have any information beforehand, you know? So it, it has been a, a difficult process. So the, the ideas that you all are sharing are good. And I think we want to kind of think through it. Um, and for me, at the end of the day, the, the, the better thing, because I don't know if a meeting with them in between me and Allegra meeting with them before, because we, we do quite a bit of emailing them in between meetings <laughs> and stuff like that. 
um, if that's really going to solve the issue, possibly a retreat might where you actually spend some time, but we would need to look at, you know, who would facilitate the retreat and things like that. So Erica, maybe one of the things that I, I would say, because one of the things that we do to do too, is kind of do almost kind of like a little subcommittee, not necessarily subcommittee, but someone kind of spearheads whatever other issue we want to deal with. And I know that since you're interested in possibly the retreat, maybe you could contact, cause you know, we want to be mindful of open meaning laws, but maybe you could share your ideas with, with Allegra and I, right? In between this meeting and the next, so that we can kind of maybe, um, you know, decipher more so, you know, more details around the retreat. Um, and then we could bring that forward you know, the next month, right? And share it with, with the whole group to see what they think and things like that. Um, because yeah, it's gonna be a process is what I'm saying. It's gonna be a process and we and we have to find out what's the best way to go about it. Cause I also don't want to just spin my wheels, you know, and try this, try that. Cause we've been trying this, we've been trying, <laughs> we've been trying a lot of things for the past few months. And that's why at the end of the day, we get frustrated because we're just kind of like, yeah, it is hitting a wall, you know. Um, so we got to find other ways to kind of communicate and hopefully be heard, you know. Because again, we're not doing this for us. These are community members that come up to us and are saying, "We want this information. We don't know what's going on. What's happening here?" You know, and they're not getting it. So, yeah. it just I want to respond. Um, I absolutely will put some thoughts together regarding retreat, and I just have a question. Um, do you think Dr. Love would be able to help facilitate something like that since she's already on contract with the town? Uh, and do you want me to, you know, follow up with Paul if that's the right person well, to ask? Why don't, we, why don't we, why don't, you know, you kind of have the idea, send it to Allegra and I, and then we can kind of best think through, Absolutely. yeah, how, yep. how to kind of move forward and things like that. You know, great i will do that idea too in terms of barbara especially since she was involved with cswg with us when we were cswg and so on and so forth she has a, a good kind of um you know in, like knowledge around all of these issues and, and yeah that would be a good idea um martha we're just going to wait for the next public comment um before we kind of you know invite you in okay <laughs> um so the the other the last thing that you know I wanted to discuss you know because I know we, we can't get to everything was just um, scheduling a time to meet with the town council. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you all talked about it at all, Lego, because I know I had to leave the last time. Not really, because I want you to be part of the discussion. As okay. Well. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, in in regards to that, we were just feeling like you know with all of these issues, especially us hitting walls, you know, time and time again, one of the things that we want to do is to also uh, bring it forth to town council members, right? What we're doing, um, you know, the issues, the concerns that we have and things like that. And I know that there's certain town councils that I know I've talked to and they're always kind of like, what, this is what's happening. A lot of them don't know uh, what is actually occurring around these issues, right? Social justice, inclusivity, diversity, and, and anti-racism within our town uh, structure. And so I, I don't think it would be a bad thing for us to just, you know, um, you know, contact, um, what is it? Who's the chair there? I'm forgetting her name right now. Lynn. Lynn, Lynn yeah, contact Lynn and see when we can get on the schedule, right? Because we know it, it probably won't be soonish, but at least if we have, a, let's say, even if it's in February or whatever, but we have a time certain when we're going to meet with them, then we can prepare, right? And we can put it together. And then, you know, how we've done it, I, I, I know with CSWG, how we did it before was just, you know, at a little PowerPoint. Um, and then, you know, Allegra and I would present it, but we, as a committee, we would put together the PowerPoint, right? We would put together what, what it is that we want to discuss. And then we would come in as a body to the town council and be prepared, right, after Legra and I do the presentation to respond to any questions and things like that, you know. Um, but I think we haven't presented to the town council in quite a while. Um, and I think given all of these issues and the impending administration change, 
our work is going to be a lot more critical. It's going to go from, if we think it's already at this level, it's about to go to this level <laughs> in terms of importance, in terms of people needing us to really communicate you know, their urgencies and their concerns and their issues. Our, our, our committee is going to be pivotal during these next four years. Um, so that's why we need to kind of, you know, really think through and start already kind of telling the town council, look, bum, 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 and then make it a consistent thing that we go and see them, you know, put it on the schedule, maybe every six months or whatever that we go and we, and we, we, we discuss it with them. So, um, just wanted to get a sense if, if people were on board with that, because if so, then, you know, Lego and I could, could reach out to Lynn, at least get the conversation going in terms of, you know, getting a date, because like I said, it probably wouldn't be until probably like February or something like that. I, I wouldn't see it happening anytime, you know, in de December or January. Go ahead, Erica. I would only advocate that I think we should have a retreat beforehand, but at the same time, I think one of the questions for town council, especially since part of our mission and our charge is to advise other, um, you know, the town council and other committees and the department and the towns, uh, the town uh, of Amherst around racial justice issues, that we also ask the town council, what are they doing? And maybe even getting together with other, um, you know, uh, committees such as the Human Rights Committee about how can we collaborate, especially as we see more hate crimes or people being very anxious and scared. Um, and how do we actually also uh, educate people uh, the way you know, uh, uh, Everald was talking about? We need to get information out. People need to be ready to say, you can't speak to me like that, you know, whatever. Um, to really, you know, develop a, a resiliency shield um, or even a bystander program where a bystander hears something and steps in because they may have more collateral of power because it might be a white male or, um, or where a couple of women of color together um, and to really, you know, think proactively about what we're going to do as a town to make sure that our people are safe. Yeah, definitely. Very Thank good point. you, Erica. Um, and I think... I just, I kind of want to make sure I have an understanding of what we think some of our next steps are in terms of goal setting. So like, rather than having that discussion now, we want to table that for a retreat that would include goals for the committee, but also possibly like putting together a speaker series. And I think that maybe that's a way that we can tap into some of what you're saying. It's like, if we have a bystander training, if we have know your rights trainings, if we figure out how to disseminate some of this immigration law information into communities where it might be the most needed. Um, those could be speaker, you know, things that we do in a speaker series. Um, so well, I mean, I, I think I might tweak it a little bit though, Allegra. I think, yeah. I think me and you, I think, you know, cause several people um, shared ideas, like even Avril shared like the two meeting idea and everything. I think mm -hmm. we want to think through that because the retreat. So, so Erica's going to send us and work with, you and I around kind of like some ideas around the retreat that we'll bring back to, to the committee. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that might be a, a, a chunk, bigger chunk of time. Also, like almost like what Human Rights Commission is doing, right? They're doing like 11 to five or something like that. We might have to do like a day long retreat, right? Where we might be working with us, but then also bring in the town, town um, personnel too, that we're meeting with mm -hmm. them too. So that might be a, 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 a you know, a, a more kind of enhanced conversation. But in the meantime, we might need to, you know, kind of come up with, if people want this, what Everell said, which is a two meeting a month idea, so that we can at least get started with the goals kind of conversation, um, but not necessarily, you know, because that's going to take time, right? And then mm -hmm. continue it once we have the retreat ready and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. thing is, I don't think we need to like stop our goals conversation until the retreat, because that might be a few months down the road type of thing until we have that going, you know, because we need a facilitator, we need, da, 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 you know, that's going to take time, um, especially with town and, and and the snail mail, snail pace that everything was. So, so that's why I'm thinking me and you might want to kind of think a little bit more about these ideas that people br bring, brought, I mean, yeah. and then, and then mull it between you and I, and then think about what we might want to bring forward to the committee the next month or in between, you know? That sounds good. 
I just wanted to make sure that we weren't like forward forging head on into goals tonight that we were kind of no. thinking like we're going to table that we have some ideas, a retreat, a possible breakdown of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, yes, definitely. Thank you for that, that clarification. I did have two not within 48 hours and then we can get to public comment if that's okay. Well, one one last thing too, oh, yeah. um, just to say that we'll check in um, like when, when, when we kind of talk about some of these other ideas. We'll, we'll try to check in with Angelique because I'm not sure why she wasn't able to attend today. Maybe she, maybe there was some confusion or whatever, but I want to make sure, you know, because she's our, you know, um, young adult voice, you know, and I want to make sure that, you know, they're they're part of this conversation too. Um, so we'll follow up with her too. But go ahead, Alegra. Um, So I had two things. One is that and I'm just going to tie it into possible goals because I know Everald had mentioned at one point wanting to maybe have more connection with other like-minded committees. Um, the Municipal Housing Trust is planning in um, collaboration with the League of Women Voters to do like a housing 101 type um, webinar Zoom in-person hybrid. We're not really sure what the format's going to be yet but they asked if the CSSJC might want to co-sponsor it. It will probably be towards the end of January. Um, so that would, I mean, I think the heavy lifting in terms of planning the agenda would be, is is in the works already through the Housing Trust and League, um, but it would be more just kind of sharing it out with our networks and, and promoting it. Um, so if that is something that we are interested in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that sounds, yeah, that sounds like a good, good yeah. initiative. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing was, I was just thinking, would it make sense to authorize Deborah and I as co-chairs to submit some sort of letter for the budget hearing for um, Monday, just saying we fully support funding all the initiatives laid out by CSWG. Um, is that something that the committee would sign on for us to do? Is that something, Deborah, you think we should do? Um, mm -hmm. It just seems like, again, that would be like coming from the committee as opposed to just the individual members. It might mm -hmm. be more like, powerful. I am awake. Yeah. So you're saying to say that we 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 fully support like the CSWG recommendations and yeah. they're fully yeah funded. And I think I have like a draft from last year that I can probably just yeah. update to be more. Maybe what we could do maybe what we could do like if you could just share that draft with the committee. Yeah. And of course they'll reply all. And then if anyone has any reservations or any edits or feedback, then you could just send it to Allegra and I, and we can tweak it. And then um, and then we can present it on Monday. That sounds good. Which means you need a real quick turnaround. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, the way, how we'll say it is just like, we'll, we'll, we'll put it, you know, we'll, we'll um, send it to you all. And then we'll say, you know, the usual, like if we don't hear back, <laughs> that means you are on board. Which means, yep. you know, if you're really interested in giving us feedback, then give us the feedback. But obviously, if you're busy and you can't, you know, then we'll, we'll move forward, you know? Absolutely. Great idea. I mean, I'm looking at the last year one right now, and it just it basically says continue to support CRESS and DEI. It does advocate for an increase to CRESS for an assistant director position mm -hmm. um, and then, in, again, expanding the DEI department to include the work of the Youth Empowerment Center and Multicultural Center. So th those are like the snippets. And then there's a, a piece about money for um, translation services. So, mm -hmm. and the resident oversight board. So I can, I will send out the draft. I can just change the date and some of the data in there and hopefully it can be a somewhat quick turnaround. Okay. Um, so the, yeah, those were the two unexpected items um, I had. 
just wanted to look at the date. So the what December 11th is the next would be next month's meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and that sound, so that will be the day after the second Rob consultant meeting, Deborah, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. after the second, yeah, um, mm -hmm. Rob consultant meeting. So I should have some, some things to present to you all and feedback to share in regards to those meetings. Um, all right, and we, I guess, we'll continue the discussion about goals and the retreat. Um, mm -hmm. And looking at schedule for the following year in terms of whether to add additional meetings in. Um, and just add there like the town council a meeting so we'll we'll talk to Lynn but maybe we'll kind of ask for it a little bit later so you know what you were saying Erica so we could do the retreat before meeting with the town council. I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So shall we move to public comment? Yes. I see four attendees. If you would like to make a comment, please use the raise hand function. And we will bring you into the room. I think Martha ended up staying in the room. <laughs> I think so too. I didn't realize that. But. Hi, hi. Well, I've uh, I always learn so much by listening to your meetings here. Uh, and as I'd said, Eric, as I had said before, you know, I feel I have to attend because it's the only way I ever hear anything about DEI and crafts and what's going on. Uh, and so one of my big concerns, so I just want to tell you that one of my big concerns is the community's perception of Cress. And I think they really feel like it's spinning their wheels and not going anywhere. I feel I understand after listening to what Camille is doing every month, uh, you know, in her presence and so on. But I, I feel it's really important to kind of get the word out. And I would strongly recommend that in your letter that you write for town, for the budget hearings for uh, Monday, Monday, that you put in a, a positive plug for, for Chris, you know, however you want to word it, but say that you you really feel that they they are, are, you know, working hard to make progress on, on you know, and you, and you can see progress month from month or say something positive and so on. Because I'm really concerned that members of the town council uh, don't have that positive an attitude about Crest right now because they don't hear, you know, what it's doing and feel it's spinning their wheels. And this is budget time. And uh, I'm, I'm really rather concerned. I did attend the Cup of Joe uh, with Paul Bockelman last week when they talked about budgets. And again, you know, there's the pressure of the library, there's the pressure of the schools and so on. And I, I really felt that, that, that Paul was not strongly supportive of, of Cress uh, in, in terms of, you know, thinking that they were really doing great things. I asked him, you know, about extending Cress's hours beyond 4 p.m. And he said, impossible. He said, don't have the staff, can't do it. <laughs> and um, so so anything you folks can do to help say verbally and publicly that you support Cress, I think would be very important at this point. And then I do agree with everything else you've been saying and the need for a retreat and all the other issues. So thank you for all you do. But um, that's my big concern right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to make a public comment? If not, we should just move to um, close it out. All right. I am not seeing any other hands. Um, 
So it is 9.06 and I move to adjourn this meeting. All right. Welcome new members again. We're Yay. very excited you all are here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is a wonderful meeting. <laughs> and uh, all right. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. See Bye. you all. Bye. -bye.